All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 63, please. And when you get there, please say amen. Amen. And amen. amen. <clears throat> the Lord has been dealing with me uh, recently. As this fast is coming up, I'm going to give you a quick explanation of what, what brings me to this uh, chapter. You know, we have a 21-day fast coming up, and all these different things run through your mind. What to pray for, what to fast for, this one, that one, health, understanding, wisdom, whatever the case may be. But I've decided just to fast, of course, with you know the needs of the church at hand and always keeping them in mind, but just to fast for more of God, more of my spiritual necessities than my physical necessities. Amen? Amen. That's what brings me to Psalm 63. You have King David here in Psalm 63 in the wilderness of Judah on the run from his son Absalom. The wilderness in Judah was a desert. Amen? Amen. So his physical need outweighed his spiritual need to the natural eye. Amen. So I'm going to start reading. Oh, Psalm 63, verse 1, starting at verse 1. Oh, God, you are my God. As I'm reading this, keep in mind where he is, the wilderness of Judah and the desert. Oh, God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there's no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me secure. But those plotting to destroy me will come to ruin. They will go down into the depths of the earth. They will die by the sword and become the food of jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear to tell the truth will praise him, while liars will be silenced. The title of this message is Making God a Priority. Making God a priority. And Psalm 63 allows us to have a little glimpse into the heart of this man that was after God's own heart. It's an emotional psalm coming from the depths of David's life. He made seeking God, seeking the presence of the Lord, a priority here above everything else. While he's on the run, I'm going to keep reiterating that. While he's on the run from his son Absalom in the wilderness of Judah, he's running for his life right here. And he finds himself in a desert, in the wilderness. Amen? Thirsty, hungry. All the men that follow him are there with him. So not only is he thirsty, hungry, and tired, now he has a whole bunch of men that are thirsty, hungry, and tired. And how many know when we when we're hungry and we're tired and we're thirsty, we're cranky. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're cranky. We can be devious. We can get mad, right? Attitudes. Amen. Amen. Point, so point number one is making God a priority in our life means that we desire more of Him. Making God a priority in our life means that we will desire more of Him. The psalmist said, oh God, you are my God. David knew God in an intimate, personal way. Now, how many know that there's a difference between knowing about a person and actually knowing a person, right? We can learn a lot. Let's, let's use the president, for example. We can learn a lot about the president of the United States. We can read articles and books on his life, about his life. Right? We can learn all about his personality, his habits, his family life, his do's, his don'ts, what he loves, what he doesn't. 
but it's still not the same as knowing him personally and having a relationship with him. You know the person. So to know the president personally would require for us to be introduced to him, right? And you build upon that introduction from there. And then after you meet him, you would have to spend time with him over a long period of time, a lot of quality time, hanging out, right? Getting to know him more, just talking to him and listening to him speak to you. And as the relationship develops, you will begin to discover more and more. As time goes on, you will discover more and more and more about the person, about the president. That's how it has to be with the Lord. If we want an intimate personal relationship with him, there must have been at one time in your life, which everyone here is a believer, right? Yeah. There must have been a time where you met him, came into contact with him, were introduced to him. The spirit is what draws us to him, right? We can't come to God unless the spirit draws us to him. Jesus said in John 17, three, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Our introduction to God comes when we turn from our sin to God and trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Amen. And in return, I have to explain this real quick just to keep, to keep going. And in return, we receive eternal life as the free gift of God, right? And then from that point, our relationship with him can begin to develop as we spend more time with him, right? So making God a priority in our lives would mean to always desire him after we met him. So after we meet him, we receive the free gift of eternal life, right? Now we take that, that and we build upon that introduction by getting to know him more, his word, by being in his presence, spending one-on-one -on -one time with him, building up, our faith, amen, encouraging ourselves by pushing ourselves to get to know him more and more and more and more. David said, I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh, my body yearns for you. But I, when I read the scriptures, I always tend to question, but didn't David have God, right? Didn't he already have the Lord? Didn't he have God? Didn't he have a relationship with God? Yes. How do we know that? You could even just use this, this, this one chapter right here. Because he calls him my God. He says, my God. But even though he had God, and he referred to him as my God, he still wanted more of God. He wanted to go deeper. You ever been satisfied but not satisfied, right? He's satisfied here, but he really wasn't satisfied, satisfied with the, a, a portion that he had of God. He wanted more of him. He wanted a larger portion of God. So he was satisfied, but he wasn't satisfied. He was satisfied with the portion of God that he had, but he still just needed a little more. How many of us still just need a little more? Right? How many of us still need to press a little more? How many of us still need to seek a little more? Sometimes you got we have to ignore the physical, right? The natural and just enter into the spiritual. Amen. He's in a situation right here where his natural circumstances outweigh his spiritual Amen. to the natural eye. Amen. But he recognized it. He recognized and he said, regardless of what's going on naturally in the physical, regardless of this hunger, regardless of this thirst, I need more of God. Even with all his men. Now, it had, they had to be, they were hungry, they were thirsty. They had to be talking amongst themselves. What's going on? We're hungry. What, what, what are we doing? He didn't care. He didn't care about the natural circumstances, what I'm trying to highlight here. He knew the importance of a spiritual, intimate, deep relationship with the covenant God, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. He knew that regardless of what physically was going on, what naturally 
it looks like he needed more of God spiritually. Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2 says, As a deer longs for water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. Listen to what he says. Where can I go and stand before him? He knew, even though he had God, he knew that there was more of God available to him. He knew that at any moment, he can cry out to the Lord, and he will get more of God, a larger portion, saturated even more in the presence of the mighty king. His whole being hungered and thirsted for more of God. Making God a priority in our life means that we go after God with an intense desire. Amen. An intense desire. A desire like never before. A desire like we've never desired before. Amen. Because just like him, it, our lives depend upon it, especially nowadays. Psalm 37, 4 says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. What if we stopped desiring material possession? What if we stopped desiring just to feel well? just to feel good? What if we desired more of God, right? Because if he's going to, if he gives us our heart's desires, if we desire God, we get more of, right? We have to develop a desire for God. We have to develop a desire for Jesus, we have to develop a desire for more and more of the presence of the Lord, for more of our lives to be steered, directed, filled with the power and the spirit of the living God. Amen. Amen. We have to desire more of his presence, more of the truth of the word. Now, remember, desire means to crave, to crave. Amen. Our spirits crave. The very presence of God and the truth of his word. Our spirits as a born again believer need the spirit of God. It's a desire that once he breathed the breath of life into us, the desire, the desire is right there. Right there. Right there. Amen. So that desire we have to feed. We have to keep feeding. And the more we feed it, the desire grows. And the more our desire grows, the more what we're desiring we receive. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Desire truth. Desire truth. Socrates, who is a Greek philosopher, also known as the father of Western philosophy, story has it that a young man would run after him, calling out to him, Socrates, Socrates, can I be your disciple? Socrates would ignore the young man. And this specific time, he ignored him, and he walked out into a body of water. He walked out into the water. The man followed him and repeated the same question to him out in the water. Socrates, can I be your disciple? Socrates turned around, and without saying a word to the young man, he grabbed the young man, dunked his head under the water, and held him down until he knew that he could not breathe any longer. As the man came up out of the water, uh, gasping for air, listen to what Socrates said to him. He said this to the young man, when you desire the truth as much as you're desiring air right now, then you can be my disciple. He's saying that when he desires the truth above all else, you see, even non-believers, when they believe something to be true, they chase after it and they stand for it. Amen? Regardless if it costs them their life like it did him. Only until he desired and craved the truth above everything else could he be his disciple. How much do we desire the truth of God's word and to know God more and to be in his presence all the more? Do we desire him more than anything else in this world? And this, I, I feel, is where God is leading me now. 
And I've asked myself this question. That's why I'm asking it to you. Amen. Do we desire him more than anything else? Amen. Do we desire him more than anyone else in this world? Amen. I remember years ago when I was faced with depression, I was being oppressed. Amen. On a whole bunch of different medication. Right. I didn't. I didn't want to, you get to a point in your depression where you don't want to do it no more. You don't want to fight. You don't want to live. Mm -hmm. Amen. You just don't want to live. And I was desiring not to live at that point. So all these different things tend to run through your mind at that point. And I just was desiring to be made well. I was desiring for my mind to be set free. I was desiring for my body to be set free. Amen. But God has been showing me something recently. Forget about all the things that I need. Just desire him. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? Right. Amen. If he feeds the birds of the air, how much more? His children. How much more will he meet the needs of his children? Amen. So I've made it now my mission in this fast just to seek God. Amen. Amen. Believe in what his word says to me, that he will give me my needs. He will meet my needs. Amen. And give me the desires of my heart. So if we desire more of him, we get more of him. Sometimes when we come to God, we don't want God. We want to be set free from what we're dealing with. Right? We want to be released from what's holding us, what has us bound. Amen. So when we don't receive that, it's easy to turn our backs to God and go the other way. But God knows the motive of our hearts. Amen. And I'm including me. God knows our motives. And sometimes, depending on where you were raised in the faith, that's going to be your mentality. Amen. If I give, I get this. If I give, I get healing. If I Just look for the Lord. Amen. Let's desire God. Above all else, above anyone else and everyone else, above the healing, above to be set free from uh, whatever has us bound. Let's just look for God. Amen. Let's feed that desire, that hunger with the word of God, being in the presence of a mighty king. Amen. A.W. Amen. Tozer said, in reference to the, old, to the um, Old and New Testament saints, he said this. Come near to the holy men and women of the past, and you will soon feel the heat of their desire of God, after God. They mourned for him. They prayed and wrestled and sought after him day and night, in and out of season. Amen. They never stopped going after the Lord. They never had enough of the presence of God. They always wanted more. They always needed more. They desired more of God. They knew that complacency was a deadly enemy to, the, to their spiritual growth. Amen? They were always, always, always looking, seeking for more of God. When we make God a priority in our lives, Amen. we will grow to understand that there's always more of God available. There's always more of God available. I say that because you can always have as much of God as you want. Right at your fingertips. Amen. We can always have more of God than we want. I mean, it, that we want. Amen? Amen? If we desire more of God, he's there. He will, it's, it's Psalms 37, he says he will give us the desire of our heart. If we desire more of God, we get more of God. Amen? And in turn, he will also meet our needs. <clears throat> when we make God a priority in our lives, amen, we will grow to understand, understand more of the word of God, understand things in the spirit, amen? We will understand that our spiritual being is more important than our physical being, and we will know how to have our physical being subject to the spiritual being. Amen. I know that was a little, yeah. little quick, a little tongue tied, but you got it, right? Yeah. God is not limited to time and space. We have to understand that. He's never tired. He's never distant. He's never distracted 
for those who need him. He's, he always answers the ones that call upon him. His presence, his presence is always, always present in all believers. He cannot be destroyed. He cannot be overpowered. If we think, even the more mature believers, that we reach the level of maturity in our walk where we can just put it in neutral and coast, we're in big trouble. David walked with God for many, many years, and he still hungered and thirsted for more, hungered and thirst for more of God. He still desired more of God. He still desired an intimate, personal relationship to be stronger, richer. Amen? Amen. Point number two, making God a priority means that we are to pursue him. Making God a priority means we are to pursue him. King David, he pursued God and him alone to fill his life. It's easy to fill our lives with other things, with things other than God, right? Even good things, but they're not God. God alone is the only one who can satisfy the hunger and thirst of our soul. It's not just fill our lives with people, amen? Let's not just fill our lives with family and friends, but let's allow God to be the center of our lives with people around. Amen? Amen. It's good to have people around. People are good. Relationships are amazing. They're great. Amen? They're a blessing from the Lord, uh, some relationships. <laughs> but we shouldn't just try to fill our lives with just people. But God, sometimes if you're a people person, it's easy to get caught up. It's easy to get caught up with the people, right? So you, you just want people around you more and more and more and more. So, but the more people you have around you, the less time you're spending with God, you find. Amen? A balance. We need a, 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 a perfect balance. Always desiring more of God and always pursuing him and him alone to fill the void in our life. We have to make it a priority of our life to pursue God, no matter the cost. The 21-day fast is coming up. It starts on Sunday. Let's gather together, amen, and agree to just pursue God, amen? And I guarantee you that in your pursuit of God, amen, in the sacrifice that you are going to make to spend time with God, God is going to use that. Amen. He's going to use that time to minister to you. You want to hear from God? Jump on this fast. Amen. You want things to change? Jump on this fast. Amen. Amen. You might mess up. You might eat or whatever. That's all right. You just get right back on it. Amen. You get right back on it and you join us. Amen. You need deliverance? Jump on the fast. You want to be set free? You want your family members to be set free? Your spouse to be set free? All of them to be saved? Jump on the fast. We're all going to be praying and fasting. We're all going to be doing it together. Amen. Jump on it. I encourage you to engage in this spiritual warfare. Amen. We are soldiers. Amen. Of a mighty, mighty army that is led by a mighty, mighty king that has never lost a battle. You will not be defeated. You cannot be defeated if God is at the center of your life. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> regardless what we go through, if we just keep God at the center, we put God in the center of our life because it, that's important because that is what gives the believer balance and perspective in our walk. The believers who pursue after God and, and that don't forget to praise him for all that he is, and all that he has done, and I don't just mean blessings, I just mean what was accomplished at the cross at Calvary. Amen. We could always praise him for the blessings. He will always bless us. But sometimes let's just put, a, let's put aside what we, the things we receive from him and, and acknowledge what matters the most, which was what, what was accomplished on the cross at Calvary. Amen. And our relationship with the Lord. That's the most important. It should be the most important thing in a believer's life. Your relationship with the Lord. If your relationship with God 
is not good, is not okay, your life is not okay. Amen. We need something, a solid foundation in order to build on and to grow and move forward. The psalmist said, you satisfy me more than the richest feast. He was never complacent or satisfied. David was at rest, even in the middle of his affliction, which would push many to fall apart, which would, which would push many to maybe even curse God, maybe even question God. God, where have you been? God, what about me? We've all been there. God, why did you let this happen? Why is so-and-so saying this or doing that? We have all been there. Amen? Even in the midst of all of that, there's affliction. The men, he had an inner peace and a calm. Just as you feel physically satisfied, like he says here, after eating a big meal, that's how David felt spiritually. After feasting on the Lord, after spending time with the Lord, that one-on-one -on -one time, the psalmist said this, because you are my helper, because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wing. His whole world was coming down. He was on the run from his son. His life was at stake. But he had the Lord. He had God. He had Available to him an opportunity to go before the Lord, like we all do, regardless of what we face, when we face it, we can still at any time, at any day, go before the Lord. Amen. Regardless what we're going through, you will always have God. He's always available to each and every believer. His whole world was falling apart, but he had what mattered the most, which was God. And because he had the Lord, he was able to sing and rejoice in God. He recognized the importance of pursuing God in the midst of it all. He knew that pursuing God is what would give him stability, strength, endurance. Amen? He knew that the strength that God would give him would Keep him, help him to remain standing so that he can keep fighting and providing for his men. <clears throat> God was David's help in his time of need. David hid under the wing, under God's wing, as a baby chick hides for protection under the mother's wing. God's powerful hand upheld and sustained King David. He was able to remain steady in the storm only because he sought the Lord. He wasn't looking for revenge from his son. He sought the Lord. How many know when you don't know what to do or maybe when you, may, you, might, you, you might want to do something you know that you shouldn't do? Go before the Lord. Amen. He'll, get, he'll, bring, he'll calm you down and fill you with a peace that, rest, that, that, that surpasses all understanding. God's powerful hand upheld and sustained him. He had an inner peace. He had an inner resource of God's strength. It was a release of God's joy that became David's strength in the time of need. He knew that the joy of the Lord was truly his strength and that pursuing God would give him the, per the, the perspective and balance on everything in his life. Verses 9 through 11 says, but those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will die by the sword and become the food of jackals. But the king, referring to him, will rejoice in God. All who swear to tell the truth will praise him, while liars will be silenced. God will fight for you. Amen. If God be for you, who can be against you? David knew this. He knew who his help was in his time of need. He knew who the king of kings was, even though he was a king. He knew that God, amen, will have the final word and that everyone that rose up against him had to deal with the Lord because the battle is not yours. The battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. So when we fast, 
we jump on this 21 day fast and we fight. God is fighting for you. God goes before you. Amen. And he sets the way. He makes clear the path for his children. And he will strengthen you. He, he knew that God was just. As he reflected on his circumstance, he had known that God was just. He knew that God was a righteous judge and that the wicked will not prevail in the long run. It may look like it for the time being, but in the long run, they would not prevail. And because of that, David could give the situation to God. He can place the situation at the foot of the throne and act with the right perspective and praise because of the faith that he had in God, because he's seen the hand of God move in his kingdom many a time. <clears throat> he knew that God would not fail to accomplish all that concerned him. God will not fail to accomplish all that concerns you. Amen. He cannot fail the plan that God has for you, what he has called you to do, what he has deposited in you, no one can withdraw. No one can take from you. Life itself cannot take it from you. If your life was taken right now, it still can't be taken from you because you still spend eternity with him. Psalm, Psalm 57, verse 1 through 3 says, <clears throat> I love the Psalms. I, I love the Psalms. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I cry out to God most high. To God who will fulfill his purpose for me. He will send help from heaven to rescue me. Disgracing those who hound me. My God will send forth his unfailing love and faithfulness. When we pursue God, we receive strength. Amen. We receive stability that have that, that it's the inner peace and that inner strength that, that the Lord releases in our lives at the worst possible moment, right? When we're going through the worst things and people say, how did you get through that? How? But how? It's God releases. That inner joy, I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about joy that's stirred up from within inside, from the presence of the Lord, because the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength, because the joy comes from within, from the spirit of God, as opposed to happiness that comes from outer extremities. A raise, a good job, new car, now that, you know, it makes you happy. But joy is something that's stirred up within you in the midst of chaos, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trials and tribulations. It's just unexplainable at times that there's a joy that stirs up that it don't matter what it looks like because you know what his word says. You don't matter what's said to you because you know what his word says. You don't matter. It doesn't matter what's done to you because you know what his word says. He has the final say of your life on your life. Amen. Thank you, God. When we pursue God, amen, we receive in the, in the midst of our pursuit strength and stability. Amen. We have an inner resource that will meet every crisis in our life. That inner resource is the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, amen, the spirit of the living God who will never, ever let us down. David says, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. If you really analyze these words, they're powerful. They are powerful. What a beautiful balance this king David had. This man after God's own heart had. Not a perfect life, no. While he was on the run being sought after by his son, to be killed, amen, he cling to the Lord. You got to remember who King David was. He was a soldier. He was a fighter. 
Amen. You and there was none better. He was a fighter. So his first response would be one to what? Fight. But he went to the Lord. He's fought in the spirit. Amen. He knew that his, his fight at this moment wasn't against flesh and blood. Amen. The same with us. David clings to God. And underneath it all, God's powerful hand was under him, sustaining him, keeping him, holding him, guiding him, leading him, surrounding him, filling him. Amen? It takes faith for a person to cling to God. It takes great faith for a person to cling to the Lord. Something happens when you cling to God in faith, church. Amen. David had a submissive faith while actively pursuing God. Amen. He had a submissive faith while actively pursuing God. He didn't just believe and stay still. He believed and marched. He believed and moved. He believed and allowed God to guide him. Amen. amen. He looked to the Lord to reaffirm, amen, to reaffirm his faith and his love at a time when most would be discouraged, at a time when most would probably even want to give up. He didn't. At that moment when you and I would probably want to give up, he got excited. Amen. He got excited about God because he knew that even though he had God, he had a portion of God. He wanted a larger portion. He wanted more of God because he knew that he knew that he knew there was more of God available to him. And that at any moment, he can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved and be delivered, especially in a place. He was in a desert. There was no church building. There was no priest, no pastor to help him. He reached to the very God, uh, 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 the God Almighty for strength in one of the most difficult times of his life. To be able to refer to God as my God. I love this. My God in the middle of the wilderness while on the run, being sought after, wanted to be, they want to kill him. At this time, he says, my God. And by faith, it was the faith, the words that came from him, by acknowledging God as his God, amen, his faith was stirred up. And that's what transformed David's wilderness experience and turned it into a worship experience. Amen. Even though he was in the wilderness, he still had to seek the Lord, pursue God, right? And for his faith to be built up because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if he's spending time with God, amen, he's reminding himself of what the word of God says to build up his faith. So he's not just having a wilderness experience, amen? Now he's in the wilderness, but he has a worship experience, amen. right? The situation didn't get the best of him. He made the situation. He turned it into a, he decided to pursue God and turn the wilderness experience into a worship experience. Right in the desert, he was hungry, he was thirsty, and yet... His deepest desires were spiritual. This blew my mind. Not physical. Wow. With every fiber of his being, he desired the satisfying presence of a living God. When we cling to the Lord, what we are saying, we're giving God permission to, not, to just to guide and govern our lives. When we become attached to God, Right? With him leading the way, regardless of who and what may raise up against us, regardless of what's in our way or who is in our way, if we hold true to the commitment that we have made to the Lord, because he will always hold true to his. What commitment did the believer make to the Lord? That Jesus Christ, listen, is Lord and Savior of our lives. Amen. Lord and Savior of our lives. He's our master. Amen? Amen. Not just the one who delivers and saves us and takes us out of a mess. He's our master. So when we start living in lines 
in, in, in those lines, amen, acknowledging that he is our master and we are to do what his word says, amen, we become cling to the Lord, amen, our, our relationship deepens, it, it gets richer, stronger, it's more intimate, you're more attentive, you're, you're more sensitive to the spirit of God, you can now hear the voice of God, and that's what fasting will do, but fasting will remove the clutter and allow you to hear the Lord, allow you to be attentive to the words of the Lord, because his word says that my children know my voice. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The deep, his deepest desire was spiritual. Jesus, thank you. Christianity is not based upon what we feel. Christianity is not based upon what we go through. But commitment. Amen. Commitment. Our relationship with the Lord is a commitment. We have decided to commit ourselves to him. We have committed ourselves for him to govern our lives. Amen. Our relationship with the Lord is comparable to a, a marriage relationship where two people commit their lives to one another. Right. And that marriage is supposed to be for a lifetime. It is supposed to be at that moment you make a lifelong commitment to that person. Amen. The two people, two people make uh, that commitment with one another. Talk to us, a marriage cannot be built, and we all that are married know this on feelings alone, right? But on commitment. Why? Because the commitment carries you through the hard times when the feelings fade away. Amen. The feelings fade. It don't always feel good. Right? It doesn't always look good. But the commitment is what carries you through. If we remain committed to God, even in the hard times of our life, even in the desert, amen, even when they're talking about us, pointing at us, don't like us, wish bad upon us. If we remain true to the commitment of God, put it like this. The pastor always says that when we become serious about God, God becomes serious about us, right? Simple, so true, so powerful, so powerful, amen? When we take our commitment serious with the Lord, he will acknowledge us, amen? When we remain committed in the midst of hard times, especially when the goosebumps die out, right? The spirit of God will see us through. The Holy Spirit will use our commitment to the Lord to minister to us through the word of the living God. It's up to the believer to stay true to the commitment that they made to God and pursue him no matter what. I'm not talking about being perfect. Amen? You mess up, you get up, you keep marching forward. You repent and you move forward. Amen? Regardless, you pursue the Lord. You stay true to the commitment that you made to him so that our passion for God can remain alive by putting God at the center of our lives, just like the marriage, right? Like in marriage, when we keep our passion alive means what? Saying no to some things, right? In order to say yes to the spouse, like our jobs, hobbies, times we spend with friends, and even our church involvement, those are all good things, but in their place. Amen. Don't allow those things to replace the Lord, the commitment that we made to the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Nothing should come before our marriage in the natural, in this world. So if we're the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ, like we are, right? then nothing, not even our commitment to our spouses and family should come before our relationship with God. God, David was under intense pressure right here as he fled from Absalom. Under a lot of pressure. Not only was he on the run, but the pressure of his men. Amen. And there were a lot of them. They had to eat. They needed water. They needed rest. They needed to know the next move. He had to think about all of those men Right? Yeah, they were they were loyal followers. 
all of those people that fled with him, where they were going to get food from, where they were going to get water from. They're in the wilderness. And he even said, there's no water in sight. He had to be thinking constantly about the safety of his men, of his people. And yet, he still did not neglect to pursue God. He still did not forget the commitment that he made to the Lord. While all of this was going on, there was much more going on, but it's, it's a long list. I'm not going to go through everything. He was still determined. He said, I will seek you earnestly. My lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift my hands to you. My soul clings to you. He made it a priority to spend time alone with God. He made it a priority to go in that prayer closet, so to say, amen, and speak to the Lord because he knew if he spoke to the Lord, God was going to respond back, amen? amen. He didn't guess. He knew. He knew. He made it a priority to spend time with God in the midst of all the problems and chaos he was dealing with. We remember people make time to do what they really want to do. Amen. Let's make it a priority to, to, to spend time with God on a daily basis. Amen. One-on-one -on -one time with the Lord is vital for our walk. Amen. Stay true to the commitment for acknowledging him as Lord and Savior. Right. And just when you don't know what to do, it's all right. So you may not. You go to the word. He'll instruct you. Amen? He'll correct you too. He'll lead you. If we love the Lord, we will make time to spend with him. Right? We always make time for the people we love. But if we love him, we spend time with him. If you love me, you will do what I say, Jesus said, right? <clears throat> when we express our love for him through our praise and worship and include him in our lives, Amen. And, and, and like what the pastor always says, we make we, we make our business about God. God will right. He respond to us. The more we, we, we acknowledge him, he'll acknowledge us. God has to not just be a part of our life, not a portion of our life, not an accessory of our life. He is our life mm -hmm. as the believer. Amen. He should be permeating every area of our lives. He should be at the center of every decision we make. He should be Lord over every relationship we have. There should be no area of our lives where God is not at the center of it. Amen. He was at the center of David's life at a chaotic moment, at a time where they were seeking his life. And I'm going to keep reiterating that. They were seeking his life. They were going to kill him. They wanted him dead. Right? right? He ran, fled from his kingdom, and he was on the run with all these men. It was not an easy time. Sometimes we read this and we just think, oh, no, this was not easy. Amen. And I reiterate that because I want you to know that even in the hard times when it's not easy, even when you don't, you may not even feel like it. Amen. Once you push yourself, push yourself to spend that intimate time with the Lord, that one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord and just pursue God, make him the center of your life in the midst of the chaos. I guarantee you, God will see you through. Amen? <clears throat> David had a lot going on here, as we can see. It's easy to see how he could not have time to spend in prayer, right? He was busy. He was really busy. The King James Version says, David was following hard after God. But God was at, because God was at the center of his life. No area was off limits to God. Amen? Let us stand as I close. So as I close, I have a question. <clears throat> and, and I want you to think about this. <clears throat> How is it with you and God? Ask yourself that question. How is it with me and God? Am I currently being obedient, obedient in my serving the Lord? And I don't mean like holding true to a certain position or no, because you can be in full-time ministry and still lose sight of pursuing the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's actually, it's easy. the busier you are, the easier it is yep. to lose sight. 
because those are all good things that can you know consume us. Don't allow work or anything to go before your worship. Review your life, your, your, your past month, week, day, yesterday, whatever, and ask yourself, did my schedule reflect that pursuing God was my number one priority? Is God actually at the center of my life? You might say, God is my priority, but you know, I'm busy and I'm under a lot of pressure and whatever the case may be. But always remember this, pressure is what reveals your true priorities, mm -hmm. right? When he felt this pressure, his true priorities came to life because he was spending more time with the Lord. He was spending more time with God. The more pressure he felt, the more he went to the Lord. Amen. The more his problems built up, the more he sought after the Lord. The more problems built up in our lives and we feel the pressure of life and everything that's going on, seek the Lord. That we need God more than ever at those moments, amen? amen? And we have to know that if we go to him, when we go to him, he's going to respond. He's going to answer us. He's going to comfort us, amen? You have, this is the importance of the word. We have to believe what his word says. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to be in it, amen? Amen. amen. Just like the, the spirit of the Lord wants everyone to know here that through King David's life, there was God still wanted to be made priority, amen. Even though he was a king, and, and and that's the same today. God still wants to be the priority in our lives today, amen. So let's join this man that was after God's own heart as he continued including God in everything in his life. Even when he was the busiest, even when it was the chaotic, even when problems kept piling up, let's decide, even when those things continue to happen and go on in our lives, let's decide to pursue God in this upcoming 21-day fast, amen, that starts on January 3rd. And I wrote here the same thing that the pastor said before, or right after the, uh, Kathy sang. When the man came up to Jesus and asked him to have mercy on his son, that was an epileptic. The man brought his son to the disciples, but they were unable to cast the demon out of the boy. So when the disciples had asked Jesus why they were not able to cast the demon out, listen to what he said to them. In Matthew 17, 21, this kind of demon won't leave, will not leave, except through prayer and fasting. The kind that you may be dealing with may only come out through prayer and fasting. Whatever you might be dealing with may only come out through prayer and fasting. Sometimes a one, two, or three day fast is not enough. When that's not enough, you have to push yourself to go to four, to five, to six, and to seven. You keep going. Amen. Keep going. Keep pursuing God. Don't give up on God, church. Don't give up on him because he hasn't given up on you. Don't give up on him. Just because he don't answer us quick, just because things don't move around quick as we like them to, just because we don't receive an answer ASAP right away, does not mean he's not with you. Does not mean he does not hear you. Amen? Yeah. It just means he's just trying to build a certain characteristic in you. He might be trying to take something out in order to put something in. Amen. Allow him to work in your life. If he doesn't answer one day, that's all right, Lord. You answer him in your time. But I'm going to keep pursuing you. I'm going to keep desiring more of your presence, God, because I need it. Amen. I hunger and thirst, Lord, for your presence, Lord, more than food, Lord. Regardless of the physical need in our body, seek to fulfill the spiritual hunger within us. Amen. Amen. Remember, those kind, whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're dealing with, if you tried everything else, they just might not come out through, except through prayer and fasting. Doors may not open until, except through prayer and fasting. We don't know. Amen? Get along with God in this 21-day fast. Allow God to work in and through you. Amen? I guarantee you, if you put him in the center of this 21-day fast, 
I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I'm positive, I'm certain, because I've spent time with the Lord, I know what his word says, I guarantee you, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. His word says so. Amen. And his word says that his word will not fail. Your breakthrough might be in this fast. So I want, I want to leave you with that. Amen. Your breakthrough might be in this 21 day fast. You're not going to know unless you try, unless you spend time with God. Unless you decide to unite with us and pray and fast for 21 days with us. Amen? Amen. 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 Lord, we just thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you. We thank you. Thank you. We thank you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you. You are so good, God. <clears throat> thank you for your scriptures, Lord. We can always remind ourselves, Father God, what is in your word, Lord. We can always remind ourselves, Lord, that we're not the only ones that go through things, God. We're not the only one, my Lord, that have trouble in our walk, Lord. We're not the only one that get discouraged, Lord. But as we read your scriptures, Lord, we can see, Lord, as, how, how your children called upon you, Lord, at the worst possible moments of their walk, Lord. They, some of them, Lord, came to a point where they wanted to give up, Lord. And we just see, Lord, that you, my Lord, came to the rescue as they called upon the name of the Lord, Father. Lord, we thank you that as our soul hungers and thirsts, Lord, for the very presence, Lord, the very spirit of the, of, of the living God, Lord, as we hunger and thirst after righteousness, Lord, we know, Father, that our needs will be met, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, that during this 21-day fast, Lord, we're not just praying for things we need, my Lord. We're not just praying, Father, for material possessions, Lord. We're not just praying, Lord, for health, Lord, for wealth, my Lord, Father. But I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, we can put the physical aside, Lord, to focus on the spiritual, my Lord. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that during this 21-day fast, Father God, your children, my Lord, are encouraged, Lord. Your children, Father, we believe, Lord, they will be empowered, Lord, by the spirit of the living God, Lord, as they set aside, Lord, their physical need, Lord, and acknowledge, Lord, that their spirit, Lord, is hungering, Lord, is thirsting, Lord, for more and more and more of you, Lord. I pray that you become a priority, Lord, in our life, Lord, in this 21-day fast, Lord, because you are God. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus, you are the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, you wrote the book of our life, Lord. So we come to the author and we ask you for instructions. We ask you, Lord, for the next move, Lord. We ask you for the strength, for the, for the courage, Lord, to keep on fighting, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, for, for your hand to be upon each and every one of us, Lord. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit, my Lord, saturate each and every one of our minds, my Lord, so that they stop playing tricks on us, Lord. But that we, my Lord, that we, my Lord, will take a stand, Lord, and make our spirit, our, our physical man subject to the spiritual man, Lord, so that the spirit of the living God, Father, can rule and reign over our lives in our walk, Lord. We just thank you, Lord. We just thank you. And I ask that you have your way, Lord, with each and every one of us, Father God. As we, my Lord, as we, Lord, seek you, my Lord. As we, my Lord, become like King David, Lord. Men and women after your own heart, Lord. Men and women, Lord, just desiring more of God. More of an intimacy with God. More, Lord, of a leading, Lord, by your spirit, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, that we, my Lord, desire more of your presence. More of your word, Father. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen and amen. 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 The altar's open. Anyone would like to?